This is Double Feature. My name is Eric, and uh, to spoil some movies here on the show with me today is Michael Kester. Yeah, we're going to spoil movies about uh, people trapped in one place. You know, we like to do this on Double Feature, but sometimes, sometimes we really make sure they are trapped in (laughs) one fucking place. We like to pretend any movie is a movie where people are trapped in one place. Trapped on Earth, trapped in the universe, trapped in the psyche of their own minds. But today, trapped in a box... And trapped in a recording studio. And we are going to fucking spoil the movies. What are the movies, by the way? (laughs) It's Buried and Pontypool. Okay. Really, they're micro-budget films with um, single-word titles. Single-word titles? You know, you could just make up whatever kind of arbitrary reason to pair movies you want. You really could. It's true. So I know that you don't like when I when I qualify the spoilers. I know. You always qualify the spoilers, and I say we've told them the titles. Anything more is a spoiler. Okay. And so, everything else is so just maybe, a toy. So maybe you can... <laughs> oh, God. Maybe you can, uh, at the very least, agree with this, then. We're going to spoil the best thing about Buried. Yes. Is that... Okay. So good. Uh-huh. And uh, we're going to spoil things that are in Pontypool. Okay. And you will enjoy <laughs> the two films more if you... Don't get spoiled about the things. The the thing about spoilers in Pontypool is the uh-huh. best thing about Pontypool takes place between the beginning and the end. Okay, so, so anyways, we're use the chapters. I'm uh, I'm moving right past the intro. I'm done with the intro. I was trapped in one chapter, and now I'm moving to the next one. All right, buried. Buried is uh, a three million dollar film, which, believe it or not, is a tiny amount of money to make a film for. When we're talking about one place, uh huh, buried. Buried is, okay, so the thing that always blows my mind about Buried is I've seen it a few times now. I own it, I enjoy it, I love Mm -hmm. the fuck out of it. Sure. It is one of the only 95-minute movies in the entire world forever that you don't realize until about the 90th minute you have not left that box. <laughs> right. Somehow right. you you have formed these images of the people he's talking to, mm-hmm. of the conversations, the places he's discussing, right. when he's describing being ambushed by the children and then the insurgents. Yeah. You get that image, but you reflect back on it and realize you have only seen Paul Conroy in a box on a phone. Yeah. You know, uh, when I come into a movie and I know it's going to be in one place... There's a couple ways you can enter into a film like that. And so I'm already thinking about that from the, the time I start. You let yourself get immersed in that and fooled by it. But before I even turn on the movie, I go, oh, how are they going to do this one place thing? Yeah. That's, that's the most interesting part to me. And uh, it's so fucking shocking when the movie starts and you're already underground. Right. You know, there's no... You can buy a little time in the question of, well, how are we going to do this for 90 some minutes? By not doing it in the beginning, yeah, uh, for five or ten minutes, sure, you know, before the credits or whatever. But uh, credits stop, and you're already underground, and that is it. And the the space that you are in for the entirety of the time is less space than we're recording in right now. Yeah, I mean, we're not trapped in a room exploring all the things in the room. We have such a small area, we can't even really. We try and explore it. Yeah. We have to explore it. Well, you, yeah, the thing is, is the really the only major discovery you find about the box you're in mm-hmm. is that there's a hole big enough for a snake. Sure. And there's a bag with some glow sticks and a note in it. There are items. Right. Yeah. And the glow sticks only really serve to provide a third color. Sure. To uh, yeah, right. To the to the film because until the glow sticks, everything is yellow or blue. Then glow sticks bring on the green, and then he has that red flashlight. Sure. Which is just, I mean, solely for the use of red lighting, I think. Well, sure. You have uh, the cell phone going off that creates light. You have, you know, the the items you're talking about. Um, Part of the allure being, well, how do you mix up a film? When I say how do you make a film out of 90 minutes, that's not hard. If you can imagine what your life is going to be like... 90 minutes from now, right? you could have made a film in that time by the, doing anything. Of that last hour and a half. Yeah, you just turn on a camera and then it's over. So to throw my arms up and go, oh, amazing, there's a film, whatever. 
Uh, I but more what I mean is artistically, what choices do you make over ninety sure. minutes so that you're not just shooting? So it's not boring, right. really. How do you get? When I say get a film, I mean get a solid, compelling film. Mm-hmm. How do you uh, do the things you do in a film? How do you mix that up visually? What do you do with sound? How do you create, you know, a character arc? Yep. How do other characters enter into this? Sure. The typical things you would expect out of any film. How do you do that when you've set a constraint for yourself? You've said, we're not going to leave this place. I think some of the most interesting art happens when you set up an artificial boundary like that. When you have an absolutely blank canvas and you can do anything, but sometimes it's actually harder to make things like that than when you go, well, here are the pieces you're given. You have to do something given the constraint of, you know, if we were to just sit here and try and come up with, hey, Eric and Michael, make movie ideas. Uh That's hard. Well, it is and it isn't. We've come up with so many. (laughs) Sure. But it's a lot easier, I think, or more fun maybe, if I go, all right, I want you to make a movie where uh, there's a guy in a box. Right. Well, actually, to be honest, that is how we come up with movies, isn't it? Sure. Because you and I sit down and go, you know what? There are no good werewolf movies. (laughs) Right. How would you make a good werewolf movie? And then, you know, there's a question to be answered. An hour and a half later, we have this ostensibly wonderful film and both go, that probably would suck in practice. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, or if we made it. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Most of the ideas we have are aristocrats type ideas. The, The great George Carlin aristocrats thing where we go, this is a great idea. Yeah. Uh, it's a shame you and me have this idea. It'll, it'll yep. probably never come to fruition. But that's uh, it's a great answer to writer's block. I mean, when, you, uh, when you're sitting at the blank page and you don't know what the fuck to do, start answering questions uh, instead. Answers to questions, easier to come up with sure. than just make things up. So when that cell phone first goes off, it tells you a couple things. It tells you, one, there's going to be gaps of time that go by in here. So we're not just seeing an hour of his life. Right. You know, he's kind of going to fade in and out. Um, things will visually fade in and out to let us know time is passing like that. Uh, also lets us know he has a, a cell phone. But I think those fade outs let us kind of decompress what's going on. Because this is really heavy from the beginning. I mean, the first thing you get is that credit sequence with the boxes. I It's weird because it seems so out of place. Mm-hmm. It seems so... Um... I guess avant-garde. Yeah. But it's also really akin to the trailer, the buried mm-hmm. trailer when it first came out. I don't know necessarily what it means. I know that it it's a little bit unsettling because, I mean, it's erratic. Yeah. And everything is squares. Sure. And that's uncomfortable. I, I mean, maybe it's just a, it's kind of a, an allusion to that you're going to be in a box. Yeah, as if it's saying, uh, it's giving you the idea that you're going to be underground without telling you that. You know, everything's kind of pointing downward. The box is obviously to evoking an image of a guy in a fucking box. Makes me think about uh, the game Dig Dug a little yeah. bit. You know, it's a very simple, minimalistic way to show, uh, to make you think about being underground. But you, when you first get footage, or rather, I guess, don't get footage, you open on black. And that kind of, uh, it forces the audience to focus on any little detail they can. I mean, you don't, you have nothing to go on. So naturally you're listening to the audio a lot. In a movie that's going to, a lot of it's going to be about audio, and that'll be true of Pontypool as well. You want to key the audience in on that uh, maybe a little bit early. Just kind of go, the things you're listening for here, those might be, I don't necessarily want to say clues, but an important tool in what the movie is accomplishing. So you just have a black screen and you're you're searching for details. The movie's just started. You want to know what the hell's going on. You're listening to that audio. It kind of makes you start doing the storytelling on your own at home. Because first thing that happens, you know, the, the credit sequence, I think a lot of people just, that's when, you know, you have your popcorn and your drink and you're settling into your, mm-hmm. your proverbial movie seat, right? Um, so maybe a lot of people aren't thinking about the movie yet. But when it opens on black, I think you start telling the story in your head. Sure. You start going, okay, where are we? It's a black screen. Maybe we're already underground. I hear breathing or dirt sounds yeah, or whatever. It's in a clo- enclosed space. Yeah. So you're already gearing up the audience to be a little creative sure. themselves. You're getting them in the mindset of the, the story. Right. Well, and that continues throughout the entire film. The mm. whole rationale that Paul goes through, anytime he makes a move, anytime he you know calls somebody or 
looks for something, it's sure. the next logical step that the audience makes. Yeah. They never they never get to a point where Paul does something and the audience goes, "Why are you doing that? That's yeah. such a stupid thing to do." Exactly. Sure. The o I think the only thing that you ever shout at Paul is stop breathing, you're going to run out of air. Well, he addresses that too. Right. I mean, he's worried about his his oxygen and stuff, you know. The breathing sound, I mean, when you're alone in that box, it's one of the things that makes you crazy. Yeah, it's Every true. little motion he makes is critical. You want to talk about minimalism. You know, he can only do a couple of things, and all of them are trade-offs. Even breathing is, for every breath I take to stay alive, I'm sucking up some of the oxygen in here. So that's how it starts. He's, uh, you know, there's the heavy breathing. You're thinking it's probably Ryan Reynolds. He's probably already buried. There's a kind of a metal clanking sound. You know, you're doing that storytelling going, ah, what is that? Is it a belt? I bet it's probably a lighter. It's probably mm -hmm. about to click on. We're probably about to see him. At this point, to get back to the idea of, you know, micro-budget filmmaking, we're now five minutes into the movie, and we have not used a single frame of footage. Yeah. This is a, if this were a five-minute long movie, anyone could make this with a black sheet of paper. No, you don't even need that, really. Ryan Reynolds panting <laughs> is the most expensive part, I think. He's uh, He's got this phone, and... You know, one of the things I like about how they're setting up all the tools here is the phone has a good amount of battery. It's not an iPhone, so it can't use Find My iPhone. We've eliminated that from the suspension uh -huh. and disbelief here. But the phone he has has a pretty basic functionality. Everybody's familiar with the sure. types of things you could do on, you know, the yeah. looking up your own phone number if you can put it in English, that uh -huh. kind of thing. And that this battery indication says, okay, we have enough battery for this phone to probably stay on for the whole movie. Yeah. So we're not going to play that game right. where, oh my God, I'm running out of battery and that's part... There's enough going yeah. on inside There's the enough, box. but not too much. Right. The way the battery works is that if it were full, if there were enough bars for the entire battery to be full, mm -hmm. you'd think, oh, he could use this phone for days. Sure. But the fact that there's one bar missing, you right. know that it can run out at any time, <laughs> sure. but you have sure. enough time. It lets us uh, make calls, and you know this becomes a, a, a tool. This becomes tactical. Mm -hmm. Now it's about how smart can he make these calls. He has a resource right. here to be utilized. It's not frantically, oh my God, call someone before the bar runs out. Because that's the that's the countdown clock. Sure. You know, that cinematic cliche has been used so often that as an audience, we know how it goes. Oh, one bar is flashing. It turns out he'll make the call just in the nick of time. That's not what this is about. He's got some breathing room here, uh, so to speak. <laughs> Who is he going to call? Is he going to make smart enough decisions? Are we going to be able to, to kind of preempt those decisions at home? But that's also an interesting thing to think about, too, because a lot of this movie is him on the phone yeah. and getting transferred around. They've now created a suspense film that, if you stop and think about it, is the same thing that happens when you have to call your internet service provider yeah. or your cell phone company and bitch about service. Yeah. You know, it's that same fucking thing where you get transferred, they don't identify with your problem, you're always talking to the wrong fucking person, no one wants to take ownership of your issue, and they just, that's a different department. Uh -huh. And what is probably, uh, I think commonly the most frustrating thing that could happen to i mean nobody likes the idea of oh i have to call my utility company right. and get transferred a thousand times uh we've made a movie out of a guy doing that <laughs> and it's suspenseful in a life or death situation yeah, right right it's when the uh the fbi agent when he finally gets a hold of him and you know i say finally but that's only that's like third rung uh -huh. on the ladder of people he has to talk to when that FBI agent asks for his social security number, yeah. that's the first moment where I go, oh, there might be another problem we haven't thought about here. Yeah. That, it kind of gives me chills. You know, there's something else going on we haven't considered. Maybe just reaching the outside world, that's no longer the scope of his problem. It yeah. might be a little bigger than that. It's something that, I mean, it's because it doesn't make sense. Obviously, he doesn't think it makes sense. Well, why the fuck do you need my social security number? Right. I'm dying. Let's get, uh, let's get working on this. You know, he talks to a couple other people. He finally gets a hold of the uh, Iraqi hostage sure. negotiated. Uh, the guy, Dan. yeah, the guy who's going to yeah. solve his problem essentially. Yeah. Uh, finally, someone who knows what the fuck is good reminds me of uh, that character from Pulp Fiction, the yeah. Wolf. Finally, yeah. a, a guy who has a plan 
and has done this before and knows what's going on. But this is, see, this is on the heels of one of the bigger discoveries with the phone calls where he realizes that the agencies have been talking to each other. Yes, and that's true. Initially, my reaction is always, wait, are they in on this? No, they're not in on this. They're right. just in on covering their asses with this. Sure. Yeah, Paul needs to be saved, but now he's, I guess, what, a liability? And they, it's, it's two machines go to work here, and it's the machine of saving Paul and the machine of spin control. Yeah. And that's then, immediately following, he gets a hold of Dan, who maybe 10 minutes earlier in the film would seem like total salvation. Sure. But now you realize that he's working for a company who is just as concerned with spin control as saving him. And now sure. Dan, you really don't know where Dan's strong affiliations lie. And this is something that challenges me a little bit as I'm watching the movie, because this is the first time that I consider, all right, well, the movie might not just be this, let's let's save this guy, but it has another level, and now I have to ask myself if I agree with that. I feel like um, this is the part where maybe, it, I think cynical is probably the right word, uh -huh. that these people aren't just in it to uh, to help him, but they have that, like you said, that sure. spin control. And I think that's a realistic concern. Yeah. I mean, the fact it's realistic is, is why it works right. in the movie, because you could at least see it happening, even if it's not the kind of thing that would honestly happen, and maybe it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't either. Anything about foreign never, relations. Yeah. We do not negotiate with terrorists, right? Uh -huh. I mean, th that line at least sticks out in people's minds. Right. So there is some level, even if it's not this degree, of spin control. First of all, he has the idea that Dan is just pacifying him. Mm-hmm. You know, is that even true within the context of the movie? I mean, how does that make sense for that guy's job just to be to to pacify the... Why pacify the hostage? You know what I mean? Well, I think the real... If the job is to pacify the hostage, mm -hmm. uh, I think the the real reason is if he gets out... Okay, sure. Then he needs to have somebody to go, they were trying to get me out the whole time and the government sure. did a really good job of, you know, the the... The Iraqi hostage situation has gotten me out. Sure. The thing is, is if, if nobody's talking to him and then he manages to get out by happenstance, right. that is a serious offense sure. against the nation. Okay. So it, it does seem to so be... So there's a reason for that. Yeah. I mean, it seems to behoove whoever's in charge to employ somebody for, you know, $100,000 a year whose job is solely to... It's insurance. Yeah. He's basically an insurance... Clause. So you don't necessarily think that Dan is the cynical part. You right. think if there's an injection of cynicism, it happens higher up. Yeah. The mere creation of his role is where that comes in. Sure. It's not that Dan's a bad guy no. or that Dan isn't actually invested, but they have an invested person. They have that job for damage control. Right. So somebody else has made the, the decision you've just made Yeah. that this guy might get out. Or this guy might, you know, he has a cell phone, he might call the news media. So they've said, well, let's find uh, somebody who's really sympathetic, who can help people. Sure. Let's create that job for the purpose of saving sure. the government's ass. Well, and the whole time you get this feeling that Dan really wants to help. Sure. Well, and that's he, the, the thing that makes me question. Right. And he lies about Mark White. I mean, right. that whole situation. Okay. So let's pause there for a okay. second. He lies about Mark White. So, I mean, you know, I really want to be on board with Dan's a great uh, guy. He just wants to help another human being. And maybe his job was created to save the government. But he lies about Mark. Why does he do that? I, I mean, I think that's, again, just to pacify Paul to keep him under control. I mean, what it does go to show is that Dan does remember the names. Okay. Um, he is actually, he's not just some, you know, some mailroom clerk that they're forwarding the, you know, the telephone number from. It is his job sure. to find these missing people in Iraq. Well, I guess what I'm getting at then is, do you think Dan is putting on a front for Paul here? I never get the feeling. I always feel like Dan is on Paul's side within the constraints provided. Okay. I mean, you get this feeling that Dan really wants to help Paul, but as long as Paul doesn't contact the news media. Sure. Because sure. then that's a stupid move. And right. now look what you've done. And and I always get the vibe that when Paul does get in touch with the news media or that does happen, Dan is more upset that the constraints are now put on Paul. Sure. That basically whoever is holding the reins, Dan's company's reins. Sure. 
they're going to start yanking back and going, you can't find this guy now. Yeah. Do okay. not find this guy. He has become this hostage icon. Sure. And by finding him, he's going to have a very different story to tell at this so point. So you think Dan is generally on Paul's side, but at least smart enough to be aware of the political context yeah. they're working Absolutely. in. Absolutely. That's a fine place for those characters to be, I think. The one other thing I did want to talk about is that uh, when you have a film like this that, you know, we've talked about never making a decision that the audience would question as mm -hmm. out of character, it also has to keep the audience guessing somehow and for you not to know where it's going. And I think the way it does that is, you know, as the movie's going along, bombs start going off, sand starts coming in, the, the cell phone battery does get lower, there's a terrorist deadline. You basically don't know what's going to kill Paul. Yeah. That becomes the it mystery starts, and suspense. Yeah, exactly. How will Paul die of the 30 things that are trying to kill Paul? And with so many choices, you can only assume they're going to throw you off the path and, you know, he makes it out fine. Against all odds, none of the 30 things kill him. And Sand kills him. That's, yeah. that's the one. Turns out Sand. Um, the, sand and False Hope. Oh, God, I love that. The music <laughs> cues up in this happy yeah. movie's ending crescendo. Uh, everyone's shouting. I mean, this is it. This is the moment they find him. Yep. They don't find him. The light comes in. He smiles. There's helicopters. People shouting his name. Well, there's the fake. Yeah, the fake out. Yeah. yeah. Well, he sees that. And the first time I saw the movie... When they, they come back into the box, I'm thinking, ah, they're showing us that so we know what it would have been like. He's not making it yep. out of this. I feel exactly the same way. So you sort of know where it's going. That's now. the moment where the film goes, he's going to die here. Yep. This is, yeah, you're right. It's, this, is, this is what could have been in a completely different situation. But, you know, by the end, I felt like uh, the first time I watched it, they did sort of trick me again. Just because everybody starts shouting. Oh, yeah. And the music kicks back up. Well, and Dan keeps saying, you know, just hold on, Paul. Just hold. And, it, yeah, and they're right. doing, they're playing on the cinematic technique of time is running out, but as long as he can hold on for just yes. one second yeah. longer, yeah. if his will to live is strong sure, enough sure. that he can hang on one second longer than a human being ought to be able to, right. he'll be saved. Whoops, not you, Mark White. <laughs> Which is, I mean, it's a double oh, yeah. sucker punch. It's just fucking, oh, God. The you die it sucks the just like everybody in, else. Yeah, it's, Everyone always dies in the box. It's rough. So Paul dies and then the movie's over. Yeah. The best fucking thing this movie does. That's how it ends. Uh, it's bold and awesome. Pontypool, a movie we have often championed on oh, this show. Oh, my God, I fucking love Pontypool. Now, I don't know if you knew this. Okay. Uh, we talked, <laughs> Buried was... $3 million. Uh huh. It's set entirely in one box. One box. Though the camera tends to move. With one person. Pontypool is made for half of that. Wow. For like uh, $1.5 million. How or something. much does that, how does that translate to Canadian yen? I, uh, no, I mean, I think that's USD, my friend. Wow. But um, there's no Ryan Reynolds in Pontypool, which is that's probably true. where that million and a half goes. Although I will say that Stephen McCaddy, I would find far preferential to Ryan Reynolds in any situation. Uh, maybe not in a box. I don't know if I, I want... I think Stephen McCaddy may be one of my favorite actors Oh, of all he's time. great. No, no, no. He's great. I just don't <laughs> want to see Grant Mazzy trapped in a box. That's an uncomfortable place That would be a different film. Be. You know what? Before we talk about anything, let's just talk Grant Mazzy a little bit. Yeah, I think we need to. He explains shock jocks in this movie yeah in a way people don't understand the notion of sure. shock jocks shock jocks like uh howard stern sure man yeah. cow yeah man uh, cow's the big chicago one yeah. right for people who might was not be man familiar. cow is is all 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 stormtroopered out now i haven't heard the radio in 12 Me years neither. i don't know the reason i bring this up is because uh people should pay attention to grant mazzy that's the you know if you ever question Oh my God, Glenn Beck, why is he a yeah. thing? Why do people listen to O'Reilly? He talks about it and he says it, and it's so simple when he says it, and I don't know why this is a mystery to people. If you piss people off, they will listen. They will get others to listen. Sure. That's why the news has degraded to the state of circus uh, performance that it has. Because it turns out watching the circus is more exciting than watching the news. Well, I mean, and that translates to even something like music. If you, um, Rebecca Black. Sure, right. Friday. Right. Nobody watched Friday. Nobody showed their friends the Friday video uh -huh. because they really liked the song. Right. 
everyone showed it to them because they thought it was hilarious yeah. or because they were somebody who was saying, I can't believe this is where music has come to. Fuck right. this. Can you believe that this is something that pe- sure, that's getting sure. popular? Yeah, and I love that. I love yeah. that because I love circus performance right. people. I love carny trash, you know? So, I mean, there's, there's maybe a, a little bit more optimistic way to look at things. When you're getting down about oh, the state of coverage and uh, politics, blah, blah, sure. everything the is BBC terrible. The BBC and... Yeah, right. God, I can't even read domestic news to find out my domestic yeah. news anymore. I mean, the the state of things are such because political coverage, we've realized, is boring and does not work in a sure. 24-hour cycle. Well, and ratings are ratings no matter what the, what the fucking programming it's is. It's true. It's true. So... I, you know, personally, I don't blame the people like Grant Mazzi. I don't I don't either. think they report the news very well, but they're people on unicycles. Yeah. That's all they are. And sometimes you like watching people on unicycles. They're performers. I mean, you, sure. could, you could say people on unicycles, and that is a more specific right, definition, right. but they're performers. They're, I mean... In, That's Rebecca Black. Yeah. I mean, she didn't even know she was on a unicycle, right. but it turns out in she was. In a way, was. it's just performance, and it's art, and it's... Right. It's exploitative, but the last thing you're going to get from your two hosts on Double Feature is is them picking on people who are exploiting art. Yeah, or being exploited. Yeah. You know, that's the other great thing about the, the Rebecca Black thing is that we created her. Yeah, you know? I mean, I feel like exploitation is a public power. It is, more than, sure. More than even an art form. You ah, have to, wonderful. it's exploitation and, and things like our shock jocks are this wonderful it's a it's a boomerang effect of kind of this feedback where you do something hoping that people will decide what you're doing is right, worth it right. but you're not actually trying to do something worthy of attention you're trying to do something that people will say is not worthy of attention sure so you know this is a special movie from the very opening oh my I mean, god just the it's that waveform yeah that what to me has become an iconic waveform. The yeah, movies, me too. It hasn't been around long enough for I, I think for people to consider it classic or iconic. Sure. But uh, man, never forget that when it cues up. It's like watching you know the opening to probably the way people feel about old Kubrick movies. Right. It's um it opens on that waveform and Mazzy's really gruff voice. He's uh he's in and out of whisper. He it borders on menacing almost sure. his voice. And when we find out that he's our protagonist, I think that makes the movie even that much more mysterious. It's mysterious enough that this isn't just a Twilight Zone voiceover, but that this is actually, one, a character in our movie, and then two, the protagonist of our movie. Sure. And not even the source of mystery. He's right. the everyman. Well, and the thing, the thing with that waveform is I always look at it as the beginning of this glut of are these clues. Yeah, clues. sure. Um. And and I don't know. I wanted to run it by you because when I watched it this time, it was the first time I noticed it. Really? Yeah. But you know how when he's talking in the waveform and he says "panty pool, panty pool, panty yeah. panty pool." Sure. Do you get the feeling that this is him on the radio after the film? Chronologically, falls after the film. He gets back on the microphone and he's kind of got the disease because he'd be repeating himself. Sure. He says words funny because he always he says it once during the broadcast. He kind of starts talking about the woman's cat and whatever. Right. And right. Uh, I just, I get the feeling. And again, I feel like the film beckons you to read into it. Sure. And I don't really know if it ever gives you any answers or if it just kind of leaves open-ended questions for you to gobble up sure, as convoluted sure. puzzle pieces. Well, this is one of those movies I've watched obsessively. Sure. So I feel like... Uh, I feel like I kind of have answers to those questions, but I don't want to make it sound like, oh, that's easy, Michael, blah, 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 uh-huh. blah, blah. Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen it a, a billion fucking times. So I feel like the broadcast at the very end over the credits yeah. indicates that um, our show has spoilers in it, that he's dead, he's gone, the studio's over, you know, they talk about um the work he had done or whatever i mean he could just be off the radio Uh but i really do feel like the ending they give you with the implication that some kind of bomb has gone off or whatever is legitimately what happens that seems to be where all the evidence points i think you know i've thought about that opening sequence a lot Mm -hmm. and i feel like uh just as with the the title graphic where they show typo and the letters kind of fill in they're just playing with the idea of vocabulary mm-hmm. and of uh, typography. Sure. And I, I guess less typography, but literally just what words can you make? Right. Anagrams and yeah. things of that nature. Yeah. You know, word puzzles. 
And so they're kind of getting your mind moving into that. Having said that, there there could be a gap where they were kind of on the radio more than they showed us while they're delivering uh, the broadcast. The broadcast we're getting, that kind of end-of-the-world transmission, could mm-hmm. be a little bit abridged. Uh, it's possible that you know the way the movie ends isn't necessarily a bomb drop, but they go on for a little bit after right. that. You know, it just ends on a sound and a, a fade. Sure. I mean, it could be that the the studio doors were blown off and they recorded for another hour and, you know, then they were quarantined mm-hmm. or whatever, you know. And it all started when they translated that message. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another really interesting question about the mystery is where does it begin? Right. What is the first clue? Sure. Because, I mean, I would argue that it all starts when with, when the girl knocks on. Uh, yeah his window right but that could have been that could have fallen chronologically before people start flowing into mendez's office that's true you never uh, really know that's the it's point so I'm, early in the morning yeah, he might be the, the that's the first. point i'm making is that the film is littered with what could be clues yeah right um and the questions that i always ask myself is are there really any clues and does it matter does it affect <laughs> sure. the greatness of the film that you can't figure it out or that there is no way to figure it out yeah when you're watching it the first time it's just so weird that i don't know if there's a a difference between there is definitely a difference to say it's so weird and also the clues are there if you had looked hard enough Uh uh-huh but i feel like it's an arbitrary difference yeah i feel like when you have something this strange the real commendable piece of writing is in repeat viewings. Do you garner additional details that would have filled in the story? Some movies, if you can solve the mystery, if you try really hard by the end, that's commendable. Mm-hmm. That's to go, well, you're, you're rewarding an audience member who is really playing detective along with everyone. But I feel like this is more a disaster the characters have found themselves in, and they only half are even trying to get to the bottom of this the other half is reactionary what the fuck is going on can you believe this is real and that's the position it puts the audience in too to say you know i went through this movie and i hadn't arrived at the conclusion by the end but i had felt like what the fuck is this real and then through repeat viewings you kind of go oh that detail feeds into this and this detail kind of explains what's happening over mm-hmm. here. I think that's the commendable part of it in, uh, in the writing. The way they're investigating this, you know, Grant shows up. He's uh, radio, what is it, Radio 660, the beacon. Right? Yeah, the beacon. Um, such a, I love that too. I love the place that they're trapped. It's this beautiful spotlit studio. I'm, uh, it's in a, a cool basement where everybody wears their coat indoors. Uh-huh. It's just, I envy everything about it. I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm jealous of Grant's wonderful radio voice and their ability to have a producer who isn't taking naps during their show and can feed them information. It, you know, part of figuring out this mystery is the roles that these three individuals play in producing this show and creating this show. Because he's on air delivering the message and he's got somebody who is researching, telling another person. They're, they're playing uh, telephone, basically, mm-hmm. right there. Somebody's doing the research, piping it to the producer, who is piping it to Grant. That's basically how that works. And so we start looking at not so much shock jock reporting or putting on a good show, although that's their concern in the beginning. As things go on, they become personally invested in figuring out what the fuck is happening. Mm-hmm. That doesn't even take too long because uh, their jobs depend on it initially. They can't even do the shock jock thing if uh, if they don't know what the hell is happening. Right. And then as it seems to be dangerous, it really becomes a matter of, okay, there is no higher priority than getting to the bottom of what's going on besides maybe reacting to mm-hmm. what the fuck is, is going on. So we get to see these three individuals working through it in real time. And that's something that in these kind of fact-finding movies... You know, it's hard to watch a movie where somebody's getting to the bottom of something just by doing research, because often that doesn't, it, it's hard for that to make a good film. It's a right. bunch of montages of people in the library reading books. You know, it's hard to make something suspenseful out of that. And Pontypool does that brilliantly. Part of it, because it relies on this audio, it relies on call-ins, um, 
it relies on uh, Kent Loney. And yeah. The, what is it? The Sunshine the Chopper. Sunshine Chopper. Yes, that is his car. <laughs> That's some. Uh, I mean, that audio is terrifying. It's right? horrifying. the The conversations, particularly um, toward the end of poor Ken's life. Yes. Uh, when he's what is he in a silo or something? Yeah, and, sure. And uh, the the I don't even remember the woman's son has yes thrown himself through a door and and has broken baby his voice leg coming out of his terrifying baby voice. Yep. Well, this is something. I mean, solving Pontypool isn't just sitting in libraries. It's riveting. It's the edge of your seat kind of stuff. But there's no explosions. There's no gunfire. There's no action. It's just audio. It's just mystery. Mystery is the thing that keeps you on the edge of your seat mm-hmm. here. And in the process of finding out what's at the bottom of this, I think the movie also expresses a great deal of skepticism. Sure. As if it wasn't winning me over already. They're on this, uh, they're on this kind of fact-finding, gathering uh, evidence sort of mission. Mm-hmm. And a lot of when you display skepticism in a movie or when you think about the concept of skepticism, it's a lot of theory. It's a lot of um, let's get all of the facts and comb through them and let's do exhaustive studies. Mm-hmm. But these guys are on the air live. So we're seeing this, this more rare practice of skepticism that you know focuses on when you're put on the spot, when you're reporting live, you have to consider, you change your priorities. You have to think about things like a hoax first. Right. To do good textbook skepticism, you can't just sit down and go, is this a hoax or not? You know, you don't want to start with your premise. But when you are giving out information live on the air, that's what people want to know. They want you to bottle things in 20 or 30 seconds. So these claims come in, and that's, the, that's you know, at the front of your mind. You always have to go, is this a hoax? How do we know whether or not this is a hoax? You have to constantly evaluate the likelihood of the information you're getting. Right. Which I think is in practice, not in theory, but in practice, how skepticism often works. Mm -hmm. Somebody gives you a claim, you're talking to them, it's the elevator pitch kind of thing. You're talking to them in an elevator, you don't have, you know, a wealth of... You don't have Wikipedia. Yeah, you you don't have Wikipedia, you don't have the internet, you don't have Snopes, you don't have a library montage. Uh, You just have a couple minutes to talk to them and the knowledge that you're already given and you have to make decisions and converse with them right there. That's the type of skepticism that Pontypool is working in. And then as a film, it's also terrifying you with the very same thing. I think uh, the moment that really hits, I mean, those audio conversations are creepy enough. The piano and the, you know, what I really like about the score is the moments where it's stripped down in the way that we've talked about um, those Clint Mansell string quartet, kind of smaller scores. To do it here with just a basic piano the scene where you know she's making tea in the beginning that piano piece comes back around and especially at the ending where it's just piano and then transmissions right fucking creepy (laughs) and enigmatic well i think one of the one of the scariest things is watching the breakdown of the once amazing grant mazzy just falling apart as horrible things happen when he's talking to ken and Ken's dying, and it's the close-up of just his face at the microphone. Sure. And he's looking around, begging for some sort of real yeah. information to grab onto. And he, he was this confident, you know, he was this hard, strong sure. radio personality. And now he's just as scared as everybody. Yeah, um, and confused. Yeah. It's, it's always those two things. Uh, one with the other is terror and confusion. If it's not chilling enough when you're talking to Kent Loney and listening to what's happening and you're listening closely because you're trying to get details, but the closer you listen, the more you have to expose yourself to how gruesome it is. There's a level, I mean, that's why they're playing it on the air. Normally this would never make it to air, Mm -hmm. but they need to mine details out of this conversation to figure out what the fuck's going on. And, you know, that's their producer's concern is constantly, I'm not going to listen to somebody die on the air. Right. But we have to find out everything we can. And so if that's not hitting home, then it's, I mean, when Laurel Ann kind of goes berserk yeah. and you see that, I, it's another one of those same moments where you're, you're going, even the doctor's going, oh, I've never seen it happen quite like this. I wonder, you know, he's detached from sure. it at that point, but he's going, uh, all right, so where is, where is she going to go or what's she going to do? 
and you're intently focused on it, but it's also really sad. Here's yeah. one of your three characters, and uh, being the youngest, the one I identify with sure. the most. And when she starts talking strangely, it's so chilling because you don't even really know what's happening, but you know enough to know, well, this is the, the this signs is the of the sign end. of it, yeah. And then you're just pissed at the doctor because the doctor gives you more information. And the information he gives you is it's just parallel to watching one of your characters commit suicide. Sure, sure. You just hate him, even though he's done nothing wrong. Right. He comes in and gives you an explanation that you don't want to hear. Well, and also he's so detached yeah, by this point. Right. When the doctor comes in, so all we want is answers through this whole thing. And the emergency keeps getting in the way. And uh, finally, the doctor's here, and we might, uh, here's a guy from the outside, literally crawling in the window uh -huh. from the outside, who might have answers, and then Ken goes, and Laurel Ann goes, and more pressing things come up. But when we sit down and talk to Dr. Mendez, the situation by then is so fucked up that the guy who has answers shows up, and what do you even ask that guy? Yeah. I mean, at that point, stuff is so surreal that you don't even really know where to start. Well, yeah, and you've been so outside, I mean, inside, yeah. literally, but outside of what's going on. You honestly don't even know what the world looks like anymore. Yeah. You don't know what it looks like to be outside. Yeah, so you sort of want them to start at the beginning, but you don't know where the beginning even right. is. And so you're just, you're sitting there and you're in shock from what's just happened. Grant's in shock. And they just have to listen to whatever the doctor feels like is, is pressing to say at that moment because you don't even know where to start. Any little detail, I guess, will help at this point. But when he lays it all out, it sounds like he might be insane, you know, uh -huh. like he might yeah. be completely mad. And a half hour ago, we were hanging up on the people who sounded like this. Uh -huh. And now the doctor's sitting here and you're going, well, as nuts as those people sounded, I guess that's just those right. are that's the arena we're playing in now. And when you see the film again and again, this, I mean, it completely makes sense. The things that people sure. are calling in and saying and being crazy. It was, uh, it was that same Morpheus effect we talked about on The Matrix, where um, I can do this without spoiling The Matrix, despite the fact wow. that everyone has seen it. But Morpheus has all the answers. And the first time you see The Matrix, Morpheus says a bunch of crazy shit that sounds like he's just being cryptic. And then you watch The Matrix again and you don't even consider, right. oh, he's being cryptic. He's just telling you. He's just explaining. Giving you all the answers. Yeah, he's just giving you all the answers. And that's what these crazy people calling in are doing. I love you. Yeah, to go back to the, the skepticism. You know, That's one of the things the doctor says that finally wins me over about him. Is he's, oh, none of us believe in UFOs, obviously, because they're not real. Uh -huh. That's the reason why. But we have a crazy situation here. There's essentially a monster on the loose. You know, Let's talk about the facts in this, right. in this case. So he's saying, I understand there's a world of insanity and pseudoscience and things that don't exist. None of us here are crazy, so we don't believe in those things. But let's talk about how words are making people go berserk. Go yeah, nuts. okay, so you just said it. That is the premise of a film that we have covered in the world. Yes. The uh, words are making people go berserk. Yeah, yeah. Has there ever been a more unusual and fascinating premise for a film? Um. Not quite in this way. No, I <laughs> certainly don't think there is. I mean, that's one of the things when you get back to that question of could you even solve the movie? Mm -hmm. Well, because the thing is, is words are this familiar, you know, that's a familiar tool everybody uses. Sure. And it's English and it came out in Canada and people speak English. So then you start sure. looking into the words they're repeating. You know how they're spelled. You have ideas sure. of phonetics and the logistics of syllables and you start dismantling these words and then you start obsessing over the words and then right. you start feeling like a crazy person and then you're already in the movie. <laughs> well, and it's done with so much care. Uh, yeah. Tony Burgess wrote, he wrote the novel this is based on, it's called Pontypool Changes Everything, uh -huh. but he wrote the adaptation too. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that feels like, maybe it only feels like this because I, I know this, but it feels like the guy who wrote the book wrote the adaptation. There is just so much, the kind of care is given to this sure. that maybe only the person who wrote the original word would have the, the integrity and respect for mm -hmm. with every little detail meaning something. Uh, 30 seconds does not go by in this movie that isn't directly right. you know, fueling uh, either the end objective, something about the characters. I mean, it's all really important, heavy, heavy stuff. And in being about that weird uh, premise... I mean, that's when you want a movie to do this, to give you all the details, because you have no previous knowledge to base any of this off of. 
you can't say, oh, this is like a vampire movie. The world already collectively knows sure. all of this stuff about vampires. That's, you know, baked in. Uh -huh. This is about a completely unique premise. And so every little, the only details you're ever going to get about a premise like this are directly from this right. source. So the movie is thick with them. It's riddled with them. You know, but it also makes you consider how you spread a message like this. The people in that fictional world, they also have no previous knowledge to base any of this off of. Right. So you kind of ask yourself what happens after the fact or how, you know, that's an idea the, the end credits play with is how does the rest of the world react when given the information in the same way that the audience is given the information. By the time Grant delivers his monologue on the, the airways at the end, the question logically comes up, will anyone even understand this? I mean, he, you know, we already played with this idea a little bit, but he doesn't sound uh, much different than the, the very broadcast we were hearing in the beginning that mm -hmm. we dismissed as nonsense. Naturally, the audience this is another clever thing about the writing. We all remember back now to, oh, we have that original thing that you weren't supposed to decipher. Another one of these kind of Morpheus uh, right. bits in the film. Somebody was trying to tell us what was going on. They were telling us, don't speak any words of endearment. They were Grant Massey at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. They were saying, do not translate this message. That seemed like fucking nonsense yeah. in the beginning. That seemed insane. And now we're going, oh, Grant has to essentially deliver that message to right. everyone else. Can he do it in a slightly different way that anyone else will even fucking understand? Or is it hopeless? Right. Gives you a ton of details to chew on, to comb back over, and much to speculate on. Uh, after the movie and outside the world of the movie, which is just the, the perfect thing for a film to do. Uh, we have a website. It's doublefeatureshow.com, and the email address to send us messages is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com in case you want to maybe talk about Buried and yeah. or Pontypool. Sure, good idea. Uh, next time we're going to do, uh, do some uh, films because it's double feature. <laughs> um, we're going to do Tucker and Dale versus Evil and Jack Brooks. Monster Slayer. I guess we're out. Watch more fucking film. Goodbye.